Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. Ancient Assyria, Babylon, Persia, out of their bloody wars our civilization grew. As one empire gave way to another, trade and culture spread, barbarians were tamed, and new cities were founded around the Mediterranean. From bronze to iron, this time on the Western tradition. And now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time, you may recall, I ended on a subject dear to the heart of many of us, money. Now, there was growing prosperity in Mesopotamia among the merchants and also among the temples which filled their treasuries and put the money out to rent. In other words, they acted rather like banks. And yet this new wealth benefited only a small part of the population. And oddly enough, one of the major factors in spreading the wealth and breaking up the rather stifling institutions of the third millennium were the great plundering wars in which the kings of Akkad and later of Babylon and Nineveh distinguished themselves. It was war, not peace, that spurred the greater social changes. Some of the booty these kings fought for consisted of the jewels and ores they either could not or would not buy from savage tribes or from other foreigners. The Egyptians used to send armed expeditions to extract the copper ores in the Sinai Desert. In the same way, Sumerians, and more especially the Semitic kings in Akkad and Babylon, sent expeditions north and west to get the raw materials they couldn't do without, metals, stone, timber. The plundering wars of kings like Sargon of Assyria around 1850 BC also shed tremendous quantities of blood. And if you read the annals of the kings of Assyria in northern Mesopotamia, you find them awash with pride and blood and gore. Cities are taken and plundered and burned, captives are flayed or impaled alive, and heads, hands and feet are cut off in what sounds like industrial quantities. But between the rapes and murders and humiliations, there are also long lists of plunder, silver and gold and metals and crops and cattle and slaves. There is one revealing passage from the Assyrian king Assurbanipal of the 7th century BC who boasts, the people, the asses, camels, sheep, I carried away as spoils to Assyria. When Assurbanipal distributed the camels and sheep to his people, there were so many that they came down in price until they were a drag on the market. As the king tells us, tavern keepers got camels, slaves received camels, brewers for a drink of beer and gardeners for a basket of fresh dates. And so the forcible distribution of conquered wealth that had been hoarded in treasuries 
spread purchasing power throughout Mesopotamia. And this stimulated demand and it stimulated production, while at the same time, war captives swelled the supply of slaves and of available skills. The merchants who then contracted to dispose of the loot and the tribute, these merchants could make profits and the staff of the merchants would benefit too. And so a distinct social group began to take shape that we might call a middle class, in between the warriors and priests on one side and the poor masses on the other. And the money economy spread until even land, no longer the sole property of God or king, even the land came to be bought and sold just like any other commodity. And war also helped spread what we might call culture. The success of the Akkadian armies, for example, was due to their superior bronze weapons and their superior armor. If you wanted to resist the Akkadians, you had to manufacture similar armaments, you had to find smiths and supply them with raw materials, you had to organize trade. So the imperialism of societies like those in Mesopotamia either conquered and assimilated or else generated resistance. And resistance in turn generated Bronze Age economies which were dependent on trade and which were as close to those of the aggressor as the resistors could possibly make them. It's possible, in fact, to argue that technological and economic improvements throughout history followed less the plow than the war chariot. And what was true in the early Bronze Age, around 2400 BC, seems to be equally true of the period of anarchy several hundred years later, when one barbarian dynasty succeeded another in Babylon, and nobody's property or life was safe from the endless raids and wars of the time. What happened in those circumstances was that the pillaging of the countryside and the disruption of the great estates emphasized the value of incorruptible and much more mobile metal wealth as compared to the real but perishable wealth produced by the land. It was easier to safeguard a bag full of silver than a field full of barley. During this period, the natural economy collapsed in anarchy over and over again. And this too encouraged the spread of the money economy. And as the money economy spread, or at least exchanges spread, production for the market became increasingly common. Businessmen realized that they could go in for speculative imports of cargoes of this or that to sell in the market and that they could make better profits this way than by working on commission to get specific articles that a state or a temple might order. This was so in part because there were more people buying in the market. In Mesopotamia, as in Egypt, the end of the second millennium saw the rise of an army of literate officials appointed by the state, ranging from junior clerks to judges, collecting taxes and fines and keeping accounts, and they got their incomes not just in kind, but in money too. They didn't have farms of their own. They couldn't produce their own necessities any more than the soldiers could who came back with captives and goods. And so all wound up as buyers in the bazaar. And there were also growing numbers of professional priests as the victorious rulers and the superstitious citizens endowed more and more temples and chantries. And these priests would go shopping too. So now craftsmen and peasants find a growing market for their products like these jars and they begin at last to get a larger share in the technical benefits of civilization beside an arrow in the back. 
Metal begins to spread to the countryside and even Egyptian peasants now start to use tools made of metal. Around 15 or 1600 BC, iron was so rare that it was worth twice as much as gold. After 1200 BC, when they learned how to harden iron by carburation, it becomes increasingly affordable and it provides better cutting tools, whether for shearing wool or castrating animals or humans. Because iron is cheaper to produce and more readily available than bronze, it democratizes agriculture and industry until around 800 or 900 BC. Cheap iron perfects the process that economic imperialism had started a thousand years before. The peasants could finally afford iron axes and plowshares. The common artisan could own his own toolkit and be independent of temples or patrons. And the commoner could use iron weapons and meet Bronze Age knights like this one on better terms. Which also means that iron democratizes warfare. Poor and backward barbarians could now challenge the armies of civilized states, which until then possessed a monopoly of bronze armaments. So once again, the interaction between war and technology becomes manifest. The Bronze Age collapses around the end of the second millennium and we see the rise of great military empires which are able to fulfill the aims of earlier Mesopotamian powers by gathering in all the lands and the products that their poor native economies might need. And next, we get several centuries of blood and gore and chaos about which we can speak calmly because we weren't there. And then when we look again, we find that things have moved forward once more. Between about 1000 and 500 BC, the zone of literate urban society had expanded far more than it had grown in the 15 centuries of the Bronze Age. The change was largely due to the great empires of Assyria and Neo-Babylon and Persia, each of these empires unified tremendous territories under their rule, and even though they did this at frightful cost in human lives and wealth, the political unification they imposed promoted intercourse on an unprecedented scale over a wider area than ever before. As armies and slaves and skilled workers and traders moved all over these vast areas, they developed a lingua franca, a common speech, so they could make themselves understood wherever they went. It was a Syrian language from the region around Damascus, and it was called Aramaic. Aramaic had its own script with 22 letters, all consonants, as in most Semitic languages. It was then absorbed by the Chaldeans who ruled in Babylon and later adopted as the official language of the Persian Empire around the 6th century BC. In the process, it replaced Hebrew as the language of some of the Old Testament texts and it's probably what Jesus and his apostles spoke centuries later. The Assyrians, and still more the Persians, also built post roads to collect tribute more effectively, and these roads were used by soldiers and officials and couriers and merchants. By the 5th century BC, even people of modest means like Herodotus, the first professional travel writer, could afford to tour the backlands of Asia. The Assyrians and their Neo-Babylonian heirs were also forcibly transporting whole communities from one end of their empire to the other to make them less dangerous by getting them away from home. One unintended result of this was a very thorough pooling of peoples which made the big cities thoroughly cosmopolitan. 
The Assyrians brought disaster to, among other peoples, the Hebrews who may have come from Ur in Mesopotamia, but who eventually settled to the west in Canaan by way of Egypt. The Hebrews established two kingdoms in Canaan. One was called Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem, and the other called Israel to the north. This northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The Old Testament's book of Isaiah, which was probably written shortly after, describes what it must have been like. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. In your very presence, aliens devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by aliens. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. In 586 BC, the Hebrew southern kingdom of Judah was also defeated, this time by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II. Thousands of captives were taken off to Babylon and enslaved. But the Hebrews were not the only people to be moved about in this way, and there were also many members of subject communities who were recruited for service in the imperial armies. In the 6th and 5th centuries BC, the kings of Persia hired archers from Central Asia, and Indian chariot troops to fight along with Syrian levies and Greek mercenaries. And these people carried the germs of one culture to another, just as the caravans and the ships that moved about in increasing number through the vast, relatively pacified, relatively secure empires. The largest of these empires was established in the 6th century BC when Cyrus the Great of Persia made an alliance with Babylon and then led a rebellion against the Medes who were the overlords of Persia. Through subsequent conquests, the Persian Empire spread from India to the Aegean Sea. The Persians were warrior horsemen ruling over a terribly disparate empire. As conquerors, the Persians and Medes were the privileged dominant race. Their king was not a god, rather the delegate of a god the way local people were used to having, and the way the god designated him was characteristic. The particular warrior chief whose horse, a sacred animal, had been the first to neigh in salute to the rising sun, became king. Whether the great king was mortal or divine, his subject people still had to pay tribute, as you can see them doing on the walls in Persepolis, the Persian capital in present-day Iran. The Medes and Persians themselves, on the other hand, owed only military service. But as the empire expanded, there weren't enough Medes and Persians to go around. So the subject peoples had to serve as well, which meant they were forced to bear arms in defense of a state that kept them in servitude. So the Persians really couldn't rely on their loyalty, as they eventually found out. Still, for a century or so, the Persian centralized bureaucratic state kept the peace, more or less, and that's nothing to scoff at. And the Persian peace helped to spread civilization from Asia Minor into the Mediterranean. There, in that great Midland Sea, a few hundred years before the birth of Christ, we find vigorous barbarians tamed by rubbing against Syrians, Phoenicians, Persians, Egyptians, Barbarians who are going to create an intellectual and artistic renaissance which combines strength and a new vision with the technical skills that they learned from the older traditions of the Near East. After the 9th century BC, the Phoenicians founded new cities around the Mediterranean and after the 8th century BC, the Greeks founded theirs. 
But these cities were not established to be provincial capitals and garrison towns and tax gathering centers for the central power as the Asian cities were. Instead, they were overseas settlements of emigrant farmers for whom there was no room in the narrow coastal plain of Phoenicia and the still narrower valleys of Greece. What these colonists wanted were new lands to till, new fishing grounds, new bases for piracy and commerce. So the Phoenicians colonized North Africa, and from there, fanning out from Carthage, they colonized Western Sicily, Sardinia, the coasts of Spain. While the Greeks spread round the Black Sea and westward to Eastern Sicily, Southern Italy, and on to Marseille. Finally, there were the Etruscans, a people from Asia Minor who had probably learned civilization through mercenary service in the imperial armies of the East, and who established themselves as a ruling class among the Indo-European farmers in central Italy around Florence. The Etruscans imposed their kind of civilization on the barbarian natives and they founded small cities as centers of an urban economy. But some of the people they conquered with great brutality were able to expel their alien masters and turn the weapons of civilization against their oppressors. And among these people, the most notable would be an obscure tribe or federation in South Central Italy called the Romans. At any rate, one thing the Greek and Phoenician colonists brought with them was a simplified form of writing using 22 signs to denote the consonants which had been developed in some Canaanite or Phoenician city and which would become the parent of our modern script. With the alphabet to simplify things, reading and writing became as simple as they are today. Literacy ceased to be the mysterious privilege of a highly specialized class of priests and scribes, administrators, engineers, medical men, merchants, even some soldiers were learning to read and write. By the 7th century BC, common mercenary soldiers, both Greek and Phoenician, were educated enough to scribble graffiti on their helmets. The Greeks then took this Phoenician script, converted some of the signs for peculiarly Semitic consonants, and invented a few more signs to express in Greek the vowel sounds that the Semites had ignored, but that you need in Indo-European languages. And it was apparently from Greek colonists in Italy that the Etruscans, and hence the Romans, learned how to read and write. Of course, those who did read were not very numerous, but their appearance meant that a new distinction would join and reinforce the old distinctions between rich and poor, high and low. Literacy created a barrier which has persisted ever since between the educated and the uneducated sections of society. But literacy also provided a means of communication that could last through time. A means of communication which not only stabilized culture, but also allowed it to accumulate and grow by compound interest, because knowledge was no longer condemned to die with those who held it, or at best to be passed on, garbled by word of mouth. It could be recorded, preserved, assimilated by following generations, referred to, added to, summoned up at will, a treasury of memory and inspiration, or quite simply, information. So here you have the beginnings of our world in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. If you are looking for origins, you might say that our culture, our Western culture, is an Asian culture. 
and that the Western tradition has its roots in that great dust heap of history that runs from the Black Sea to the Persian Gulf, a dark and bloody ground that we never cease to recreate in our gods, in our wars, in our restlessness, but also in our inventiveness and enterprise and expansionism. And this is even truer of the Mediterranean, which is a kind of liquid history around whose shores the old traditions were transmuted and from whose shores they have irrigated the entire Western world, as we shall see in the programs ahead. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.